And welcome to the Social Work Services Committee of Tuesday, 23rd of April, 2019. Um, if you would note that this meeting will be recorded and subsequently made available to the public for listening purposes, and if you could uh, maybe turn your mobile phones to airplane mode or silent, please. That would be really appreciated. Uh, just a quick um, word as well. Uh, we've got um, a welcome to Councillor Scobie, who's attending the committee today, and also just to thank uh, Councillor James and also Councillor Nicholson for their contribution there's been a wee bit of a turnaround in membership in the last few weeks, so um, but it's always good to see you all here today. So with that, I'll move on um, to Cedra and apologies. If you could confirm that for us, please. Good morning, everyone. We have 14 members present. We are quorat, and so far I have received an apology from Councillor Sloan. Councillor Justy, do you have an apology? Thank you. I've got apologies on behalf of Councillor Crothers, Councillor Ingalls and Councillor Tate. That's noted. Thank you. And I can confirm we actually now have 15 members present. Thank you. Uh, do we have any declarations of interest from members of the committee? No, thank you. Um, so if we move on then to item number three, which is the minute of the previous meeting, 19th of February, are we happy to note that? Take that as a yes, thank you very much. Um, item four then is Health and Social Care Partnership Report by Chief Social Worker Officer. Um, we have Lillian here who's going to speak to, uh, basically we're being asked to note the social care services set out in the Scottish Government guidance and also um, the integration scheme, which includes the functions delegated uh, as at the paragraphs in the report. Because I think we'd asked at the last meeting just to get a bit more detail on what our delegated budgets uh, included in terms of services. So um, with that, Lillian, you want to add anything to this for starters? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, members. Just to advise that um, I have provided information as requested with regards to the delegated services. And you will see at the appendix the associated funding with each of these services. And members will note that there's a full report at agenda item five from the financial director for the Health and Social Care Partnership. Thank you. So with that, uh, we're actually being asked to note a number of the recommendations here, but I'm happy to take questions on this if there's any members wishing to ask. No, with that then, um, are we happy to note the re recommendations as set out? 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3. Thank you very much. So, with that then, uh, we'll move on to item five. Uh, and we have Katie Lewis here and uh, Sean from our team uh, to answer questions on delegated social work funding and health and social care partnership. Um, so this is, a, I suppose, a different perspective on, on how the budgets are spent in the region. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, Katie, you want to maybe add anything before we start taking questions on the report? Um, no, other than to say that um, the paper that you've got reflects the latest position. The IJB pr approved the um, budget for um, 1920 at its meeting on the 3rd of April, so happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from members? Councillor Murray? Uh, it's really um, a question actually going forward rather than that, look, looking back if you don't mind, but I just want to know that the uh, Health and Social Care Partnership has to make a considerable amount of savings uh, and that um, we passed over 97.8% of what we got from the Scottish Government uh, to the Health and Social Care Partnership to cover the delegated functions. What actually happens, I know, I don't think all the savings have, have been identified yet. How does that Im impact on the delegated functions? I mean, are these definitely going to be done because we've provided the 97.8% of the funding or would savings be made from some of our delegated functions? Yeah, I mean, what you're reflecting is the fact that we've got incredibly challenging savings um, across the partnership, 19.5 million across both the health and the social work delegated budget. What, what we have undertaken to date, albeit um, 
one of the principles of the integration joint board was to look at, at pool of resources and to um, to work in a, a very integrated way because of the significant challenges that we've had on both sides of the the budget um there's certainly no intention at this stage to um to take savings from one part to, to balance off the the challenges within the other we recognize um that both in terms of the three million savings on the delegated social work budget and the balance of the savings within the health budget that there will be some really um challenging decisions to be taken as a partnership as as we move forward the kind of areas that um that we've been looking at to date particularly around the the social work budget is is looking at things like introducing um real-time monitoring across all services, um, reviewing our contractual arrangements um, and controlling demand and, and things across existing services. Um, and we are kind of, we are expecting that the social work budget will come into balance once we've put in all of those measures, but there's a lot of work to be worked through with, with um, the chief social worker and the team as, as we move forward. Um, in terms of the, the health aspects of the budget, um, that's where there is, the, the biggest level of challenge. Um, and those of you know I've got a, a dual role. I'm, I'm also director of finance for the health board as well as, as chief finance officer. Um, and I think that we are in uncharted territory in terms of the, the scale of the financial challenge around that. Um, there's work that I've been doing with Julia's chief officer um, to look at what our financial improvement program looks like across the, um, the partnership. Um, and we're just in the process of, of getting that established, working across um, across both health and social care to, to look at a whole range of measures that, that we want to put in place to kind of make some of those savings um, from ranges, from looking at improving our financial governance, but also the work that we've talked about before in terms of some of the, the transformation programmes that we need to take forward as a partnership. Just um, <clears throat> following on from that, um if the health board is un, unable to identify savings, previous health boards have gone to, I think it's called brokerage or some strange expression like that, would that be likely to apply in this case? And would it include the delegated functions or would it be solely for the health side of it? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in a unique situation because the entirety of the health budget is delegated to the partnership. Um, we are not at this stage um, looking at seeking brokerage from the Scottish Government, albeit it is something that we've considered as, a, as an NHS board. Um, we have to look at the delegated budget as well as the, um, the wider kind of health services piece. Um, and my intention is that we review that through the year and, and where we take an open and transparent approach in terms of the discussions that take place around that. Um, we know from speaking with other colleagues that this is we're not unique in the in the sense of the challenge across Scotland in terms of health boards in particular is is quite significant. Uh, Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, it's those challenges, and only was it the back end of last week? I think I read in, in a press article of some 19 million that needs to be saved in Dumfries and Galloway through health and social care. But it's the impact uh, of all this savings, uh, and in particular to the west of the region, uh, and Stranraer again in particular, under adult services, the residential homes, uh, the lack of, if you like, and I've raised this a number of occasions with Julie, uh, through the IGB uh, representation that I've made. So it's how are we going to address the, the, the lack of provision uh, and the residential care. Uh, and I think this is uh, highlighted in the delayed discharges that, that, that we see. And my other question would be on third sector support on the strategic commissioning. And only last week I met with the trade union side uh, and they've got serious concerns in terms of the commissioning and the level of uh, service being provided there uh, against the quality as well uh, on training. Uh, I see panic there. Uh, I don't know who will address these both these questions, but it's the impact of those services locally, uh, at least west of the region, where it's very acute in terms of you know social work. I say this because just again uh, within the last month, I met with the 
uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health, and she made it quite clear that it's the responsibility of the council in terms of the social care side and not the IGB. Uh, so it's in terms of this social work committee and the, the remarks made, now I may not agree with, with the cabinet secretary, but that's what she said, that responsibility lies with the council in terms of the delivery of the, the, the social care side, not the NHS. Okay, who's, who's wanting in first there? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, Julie, as Chief Operating Officer, is going to approach um, to assist, but um, Kate is going to offer a comment first, Willie. Yeah. I suppose just starting with, in terms of our approach to savings, we've, we've not taken a differential approach across the region. All areas are being treated in, in the, the same way, for want of a better way of describing it. But what we do recognise is that our challenges in the west of the region are, are, are quite significant, and that's the work that you've been doing and engaging with, with Julie on, and, and that's why I've asked Julie, because she's obviously more versed on the detail of that. Okay. Um, I think Councillor Scobie, you know, I've been very open around the, the challenges that we have around delayed discharges um, within the partnership, um, and those challenges vary across the region, but they are, um, partic they are pronounced in the west of the region in relation to people who are waiting for care home placements. But what we see right across the region um, at the moment is challenges in our um, ability to um, secure um, care at home provision as well. So as a partnership, we have been working with our providers and working with the in-house care at home service to look at what we can do in order to increase the capacity of that service. The IJB is absolutely fully aware of the challenges that we've got. And, and although we're talking a finance paper here, um, Councillor Scobie, the, the, the issues aren't financial. The issues for us primarily are about our workforce and about us securing an appropriate workforce. And, and I've talked about that before at committee, that the workforce challenges that we've got in the Health and Social Care Partnership aren't unique to, you, you all read about councillors, um, consultants, not counsellors, consultants in the NHS and the, the inability for us to recruit consultants, GPs, etc. But we've got those challenges in the partnership in every profession that we look at. And what we are, we are um, challenged with just now is our ability to um, secure um, sufficient capacity in our care at home service. And that is meaning that our number of delays are increasing across the region. But we are looking at that right across the partnership. We're looking at how we can invest more in our reablement service um, in order to support people to be reabled within their own homes to bring them to a sort of optimum level of um, independence within the community setting. Um, you're absolutely right to highlight it as a challenge and as I say it's one that we're working on but the, the, the real challenge we've got is about how do we make um, roles attractive, how do we attract people into the caring um, sector. If, if we let Lillian in here, just in terms of the staff question about uh, maybe quality of service, etc. So, uh, Lillian. Just to confirm, Councillor Scobie, that um, we, re we retain the professional oversight of the service delivery, but the actual operational delivery because of the scheme within Dunfries and Galloway uh, sits with the Delegated Services Health and Social Care Partnership. So certainly we have the oversight and the overview professionally, um, and that's why the, the relationship within the partnership is important as we take it forward. Go on then, Willie. Thank you, Chair. I'll let me back in. I, I take the point that Julie's making, and we have discussed this, but you know, it, it, it's this whole increase in delayed discharge and to finding what is the solution, notwithstanding what you're saying, Julie, that it is a, a, a staffing issue recruitment and, and, and so forth, which I fully understand, but we still need to find a solution. Now, it's where does that solution lie? Does it lie with IJB? Does it lie with, 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 with social workers? <laughs> Norton, he's saying it does lie with the IJB, if, if I pick you know, your, your gesture there. But, but we need to find that solution because we can hear people staying in hospital longer than what they, 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 they require. I'm sure they don't want to be and you don't want them there. So we need to find the solution, and that solution has been going on and on and on. And, and we need to find what is the solution, notwithstanding, again, some of the, the, the issues that you raise. Uh, and in terms of Lena's response to the commissioning, I think it's something that we need to pick up with the trade union side if there are concerns uh, of the, 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 the level of service and the quality. 
Uh, and I think that's something that we need to pick up, whether that's with, with the, the oversight that we've got as a social work committee and or uh, IGB in terms of what we are commissioning and whether there is value for money in there and, and we're getting the proper services. So on both fronts, not with, again, that, that I recognise this is uh, a financial paper, but it's the only place I could, you know, hang the, the, the two issues. Thanks, Willie. Uh, and I think you do raise uh, a point which, unfortunately, is out with the gift of this committee to fix uh, directly, which is the, the there is clearly an issue in terms of recruiting and retaining, and that's been well rehearsed through many of the committees at this council, which all members are probably aware of in terms of their localities, in terms of their recruitment. Um, However, as you, as you rightly say as well, this is a financial report, so unless there's anything else you want to add, uh, Julie? Thanks, Chair. I simply just wanted to add in relation to Councillor Scobie's specific question about whose responsibility it is. Um, I mean, I think the legislation is really clear that the responsibility for the planning and the commissioning of the services sits with the IJB. And the way in which we have our schemes been set up locally in terms of the delivery of those services they are then delivered through the Health and Social Care Partnership, which is a partnership between the local authority and the NHS. But the actual response, so when those, all those functions that were in the first paper that came, that are delegated to the IJB, the IJB has got the responsibility for the planning and commissioning of those services. So in terms of the planning and commissioning of the, um, I suppose, the, the, the services, the way in which we respond to the likes of the challenge of delayed discharges, that sits with the IGB in terms of how do, what do we commission in order to address that challenge. How it's actually delivered is through the partnership. So it comes back again to this whole issue about the health and social care partnership being something that's different to the IGB. The IGB is the commissioning body, the partnership is the delivery body. Thank you. And I think actually in the next report, uh, it sets out the appendix, which sort of... Uh, there's a slideshow sort of captured there for information which might be useful to brush up on. Um, Councillor Maitland, I think you'd indicated. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. If not, then um, with that, uh, are we happy to note recommendations 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 and 2.5? Um, yep, happy to note. Thank you very much. Okay, so we move on now to clinical and care governance update. This is uh, report number six, and um, Julie, if you could uh, keep the chair. Um, is there anything you want to add to this? don't think so, Chair. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. It's the regular update that I provide three times a year to Social Work Committee on the discussions that have taken place at Clinical and Care Governance Committee, so happy to take any questions or points from members. Thank you. Councillor Cairn Carruthers. Thanks, Chair. It's just in regards to the, <clears throat> the data and information sharing. Um, so, um, I just really want to know what the progress is in regards to this. I know that the Audit, Risk and Scrutiny Committee did quite a bit of work and we held quite a few workshops. We had Graham Gott for the NHS and obviously council officers ourselves. So I was just wondering where we are with rolling that out in regards to having the two systems speaking together. And do we have a kind of recommended time as to when that will be fully operational? Thank, thanks, Councillor Carruthers. Yeah, um, there has been progress. Um, certainly, I think the discussions that happened at the scrutiny committee were very helpful in terms of us taking forward. Um, there was a range of kind of technical and legal issues about the access to those um, information sharing systems. My understanding is that the technically. Um, we are now at the stage where um, we will be able to offer social work, and, and Heather or, or um, Rebecca might be able to um, provide more detail on this, but we will be able for social work staff to be able to access the relevant health information, your basic information um, through the portal, but we're not, we haven't yet finalised the arrangements for the other way around for health staff to access the, the social work information. I think that's, that's the current state of play that I'm aware of. Heather might have more to add to that. Yeah, I think um, just before Easter, we were waiting for the ISP to be agreed and signed. And uh, my understanding is that that's now ready to be signed. Um, and as Julie says, we have everything set up now whereby we have identified two teams in social work. One's the adult team in, in Annan. The other is the out of hours team. And they're going to test this out in terms of being able to access into the health record. And then following that will be uh, a range of the health access into the social work record. But it isn't about, you know, it's about being able to see 
the information in the middle, as it were. It's not about being able to actually go in and access the system itself. So it's a way of being able to see the information. And we're starting with a very basic set of data. We're going to see how that goes. We're going to do some evaluation. Then we're going to build that set of data as we go in terms of what people actually need access to. Um, Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> I mean, I think this is going to be invaluable, and I think it's really important. And at the end of the day, both organisations and workers are bound by confidentiality. So, I, I, you know, I absolutely accept the fact that it is only um, need to know basis. It should always be sh information sharing on a need to know basis, but it is absolutely crucial that this happens. I think that it will be so beneficial for the patient, the end user. Thank you. Did you want to add anything else now? You're not. I suppose it's just to sort of um, what we've tried to work on very much is this is about how we support our practice. So about seeing information sharing as part of the practice and that, you know, just being able to information share through our systems will never do the job completely because you always need to have um, the ability to speak to other people to hear the full story. So the basic set of information certainly is allowing people to know who's been involved, when they were last involved who to contact, that then they can pick up the phone and say, I understand you were in last week, can you tell me what was happening? And equally then we would be able to say, and this is where we're at from our point of view. So it's a really important bit in terms of a support to the practice as opposed to sort of almost an alternative to it. Councillor Murray. Thanks. Um, it's with reference to 3.5.5 on page 33. Uh, there's mention uh, that as part of the work of the Healthy Ageing Programme Board, a subgroup is considering the future models of daycare and day centre provision across the region. And it says also that a report will be going to the Clinical and Care Governance Committee in autumn. Um, I just wondered who is on that subgroup and how the council is represented on it, because uh, this has always been quite controversial over the years, the provision of day centre uh, uh, day centres and so on and if it's not popular it won't be the clinical and care governance committee who gets to blame it'll be Dumfries and Gallery Council that gets to blame so I'm just wondering how uh, who's on that subcommittee and who's being consulted with in, in bringing that strategy forward Julia, you okay to yeah, so it's it's officers from the partnership, so from across health and social care that are on this. So social work as a profession is represented on those um, on those subgroups. So it's it's made up of a, a wide range of health and social care professionals. What I would say, Councillor Murray, is that um, we're very clear that this review that's been undertaken. Um, colleagues might remember that last year we brought back the output of a day services report to social work committee. Um, and that had gone through the IJB and the IJB had felt that it was very operational in its nature and what the IJB wanted in its role as a strategic commissioning body was it wanted to look at what's the longer term model of day service provision for older people. So what does it look like? So that group that's looking at day services um, is actually working with the chairs of the local day centres across the region to co-produce a specification for what those services will look like moving forward. And then what they will do will link to that, what does the funding model then look like that sits alongside that specification. The plan was that that would come back to IJB in September sort of, or autumn time. Um, but as per the agreement that um, I think it was March last year um, we brought to Social Work Committee was that in any major kind of service change that the council would be consulted on that. Um, so the report will come back to full council for consultation and then the views of the council will be made known to the IJB now, so that the, you, will, you will be able to influence that before the IJB makes its final decision. Thanks. Thank you. Um, now, we've got Councillor Wood first and then Councillor Scobie. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Chair. It's the 3.5.2 Alcohol Drug Partnership Report. Where are we actually with this? Um, I know at the last sentence it talks about the committee's requested further information on benchmarking data. It's been reported in the media and such like that HIV is very much on the increase because some areas are not the offering a needle service and various other services that they require and there's cross-contamination taking place. What is Dumfries and Galloway's position? We do, um, we do have um, the kind of injecting equipment provision services across the region um, to support um, individuals. Um, so that is in place. However, what, what the, what's highlighted here 
is that there are performance targets within the Alcohol and Drug Partnership in relation to alcohol brief interventions, um, which we're not meeting. Um, and those are sort of um, sort of brief assessments that are undertaken of individuals in clinical settings, so like in A&E, in general practices, in sort of maternity services. And, and we're, not meeting our, we're not meeting our targets in relation to that. So that was the issue around the benchmarking because we were trying to understand what's happening in other rural partnerships um, because one of the, the issues that's been fed back from the clinicians is about them having the capacity to undertake all those assessments. So um, that was, that's the, the benchmark that we've been asked for and it's coming to the next Clinical and Care Governance Committee. So I'll be able to provide an update when I bring back the next report, Councillor Wood, but we don't have that data yet. Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, it's picking up on Councillor Murray Helene's point on 3.5.5 to begin with, and it's the review of day services for older people. And again, I'll refer to the West. Uh, uh, with, you know, I'm not being parochial, it's the services that we are delivering. Uh, and we just currently went on, uh, have underwent a change in the, the daycare there. And I just wonder what consultation there was with the Council, uh, given that one voluntary sec uh, sector organisation uh, terminated the contract and another one is picked up and it's in two different parts and I'm not sure if the second part of their services is being delivered. Uh, I'm interested in the long term model and, and that to come back in September, how we pick up on some of these issues. And the other part to that is the respite provision. People who require respite uh, and, and what provision we uh, provide uh, for people who require that respite uh, in uh, the areas. My other part is to 3.5.4, and again it's in terms of delayed discharge uh, and the Mental Health Commission. In that paragraph it talks about the report provides an update on improvements made across the community hospitals as a response to the dementia design building audit. And, it, and it's the people who have had their clinical uh, treatment dealt with within hospital, but then they may have uh, signs of dementia or indeed have been diagnosed with dementia but are kept in a clinical ward. I just wonder if there's any update on that, uh, Julie. And then moving into the parts in your document. Uh, yeah, uh, health and social care on pages 41 in terms of the strategic commissioning uh, and you talk there uh, in it or, or the commissioning talks about the reducing health inequalities and I just wonder you know in terms of uh, east and west whether there is still in my opinion big inequalities in terms of the service delivery and again on page 44 it's I as a local member or, or an elected member, no local, but an elected member. But, you know, and we discussed this at the seminar you delivered uh, and that you were looking at that, you'd been looking at that for three years in terms of what the role is of the elected member uh, in uh, access to many of these governance plan that's outlined there. This It'll probably take a wee minute to unpack that, but there's a few things in there um, just in relation to uh, day services, yep, and then uh, going through um, the mental health, uh, welfare, and then the governance, I suppose, as well. Um, gives you a chance to sort of break it down. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Scobie. So in terms of the um, day services, so the review that we're doing at the moment on behalf of the IJB is not just about day centres. So it is about day service. So what you've described was the challenge that we had around the day care provision out in the west of the region. In terms of the role um, of this committee, we did, um, in one of the, the feedbacks to the committee, we highlighted that there was a challenge. But again, the delivery of that service is through the Health and Social Care Partnership. So the Health and Social Care Partnership worked with the third sector providers in order to commission that new service. But the review that we're doing will be taking account of day services. So it's not just day centres. So it's day centres, daycare, and that respite provision. So that's that's and what we're looking at then is 
what is the right model of provision for the next 5, 10, 15 years moving forward for that next generation. So that's what will come back in the autumn time and hopefully that will address some of the challenges that you've highlighted because you're, you know that, that model has to be multi-layered in terms of the day centre taking a very preventative approach and then daycare providing a bit more of that kind of personal support, personal care and then um, looking at what, what we have what we intend to commission in terms of that kind of um, respite provision. In terms of the dementia, the Mental Welfare Commission, the Mental Welfare Commission was really around the, um, it was about making improvements to our community hospitals as a result of an audit that was undertaken by the Me Mental Welfare Commission around the, the buildings. Um, so it's, you know, there's lots of clinical evidence about um, your layout of your building and your um, signage, etc., to support people with dementia. So this report came um, to inform the Clinical and Care Governance Committee about improvements that had been made in our cottage hospital estate. There is no doubt there is some challenges with some of our cottage hospital estate because of the age of it and because of the layout, etc., around um, dementia-friendly design. So it was bringing an update to the committee on that and highlighting Again, you know, we've talked about delayed discharges. You're, you're, you know, the significant um, percentage of our people in our court. So we do something every <laughs> month called a day of care survey across the partnership. And that day of care survey looks at everybody who is in a bed effectively um, and assesses whether they're in the right bed. So if somebody's in DGRI, do they meet the criteria for being in an acute hospital? If somebody's in a cottage hospital, do they meet the criteria for being in a cottage hospital? And the we, we have found that in our latest day of care surveys, around 50% of the people who are in our cottage hospitals don't meet the criteria to be there. And that's something, again, that's highlighted, we have, we've highlighted that through the IGB. It's part of our commission plans, looking at what are those alternatives? How do we build those alternatives for people in the community? Because they don't meet the criteria for cottage hospitals. And what that ends up doing then is meaning that people are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, in terms of, as I say, so so that was, but that, that specific report was very much about the, the building space. In terms of your question around reducing inequalities, um, and our strategic commissioning plan. That has been a, we, you'll, you will see, um, and, and we have brought back here, but you'll also see in the reports that go to area committees, there's a number of performance indicators that as a partnership we look at. One of the areas that's been particularly challenging to look at um, is that reducing health inequalities one, because very much it's about what indicators do we look at. So you look at things like your healthy life expectancy, and that does vary across the region. Um, we've also looked at um, indicators around maternity services. Um, so it is one that the IGB is looking at, but we're in the process of developing appropriate indicators around that. It's a challenging one from a public health perspective to actually identify the right indicators around it. And finally, I think your point around the role of elected members. Um, I think what, we've, what, we're, what we're doing today is absolutely bringing to the elected members, the Social Work Committee, the detail around the delegated budgets, around the services that are delegated, the update on the issues that are being discussed at Clinical Care Governance Committee, and there's the opportunity, obviously, to question us on any aspect of health and social care partnership. But for elected members, I would also um, state that, you know, the reports that are going to area committees, we try to take on board the feedback we had from each of the area committees in relation to those reports where it was felt that they were maybe a bit cumbersome in terms of the data, the performance data that was in them and the elected members wanted to have a lot more narrative around what was actually happening around health and social care. So we've tested that with the latest group um, of reports that's gone to the area committees. And again, I'm happy to take any feedback colleagues have got if these are still not meeting your needs, then we're absolutely willing to look at those in terms of the, the information that's contained within them around the delivery of the strategic plan. Thanks, Julie. You took all five points well there, I think. Um, do you want to come quickly back in? No, I'll, I'll pick a, a number of these up when I meet with Julie in, I think, next week something. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Julie. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. It's uh, 3.12.11 where they're talking about the organisations and integration authorities working together. This section suggests to me that there's going to be the possibility of it generating a further report. 
Will that be coming back to this committee or will it be going to Cosler or where? So, it, thanks, Councillor Wood. So, in relation to all of those recommendations, we have set up um, a working group again within the partnership to look at all the recommendations. And we've been asked, every partnership in Scotland's been asked to assess where we're at in relation to them. So the plan was that we would we would undertake that and, and part of the workshop that we had last week around the Audit Scotland report, um, where members were, were invited to that, um, was to look at where we thought we were at as a partnership in relation to it. What we will do um, is collate that report in terms of where we're at in relation to each of those recommendations. Councillor Rudd will bring that back to the next Social Work Committee. So again, we will share it with you and, and have that conversation then. I uh, can't see any further questions on that just now, so if we're happy then to move to the recommendations, <clears throat> which is basically to note again uh, 2.1, the information provided, 2.2, the establishment of the Short Life Working Group, um, and also 2.3, that the output of that working group will be coming back to the next uh, Social Work Committee as detailed. Are we happy to note that? Yep. Thank you. So item seven brings the uh, external scrutiny of local social work services. Um, we've been asked to scrutinise this and consider it. So um, we've got a number of our uh, team here today. I don't know if you want to add anything to this uh, before taking questions from members. Uh, Heather? Um, just very briefly, just to sort of, it's the same format of a report that you get previously. Today we're reporting on four services that have been inspected over the last period. And we've included two whereby the grades were below three, where we've committed to bring back to you to make sure that you're seeing the progress being made in between inspections. I suppose the one thing I would say would be uh, we've done a lot of work with the care inspectorate on um, these reports and on the, particularly on the, on the two that we, uh, we're reporting on again. Um, and we've made some really good progress, um, in particular in relation to Dunmere Park. Um, we've done a lot of work in respect of um, trying to move some improvements on. That's been a major challenge and that's been a partnership piece of work whereby the operational responsibility for this now sits with the Mental Health Directorate. And I suppose I cannot um, overstate at all the, the contribution that they have brought, which has been really positive in terms of really identifying how we can move this service on. So whilst what you'll see today is a report whereby some of the grades have gone down. That doesn't reflect the sort of the current ongoing work, which I think um, by the next inspection, hopefully we'll be able to see that's actually had a, a huge and really positive impact. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. So with that, are there any questions that members would like to ask on the report? Councillor Maitland. <laughs> Technophobe. <laughs> um, th thank you. Um, <clears throat> the officer has actually put a finger on the one that I was interested in, which is about Dunmuir Park um, and um, the, the two, you know, for quality of management and leadership. Um, I wonder if you could possibly perhaps expand on where we're going with this, because that, that's not great. That really isn't. And I know it's six months ago, and I hope that things have changed, but maybe you could reassure us that that is the right direction of travel. Yes, we've had a period of, of uh, quite a difficult period at Dunmere Park, and yes, part of that has obviously been about leadership and management. Um, as I've said, um, we've moved the operational management of this service across to the partnership, which is where it needs to sit as, as a delegated service. And the, um, the Mental Health Directorate in particular have brought in some of their own managers to support us in this, and that has fundamentally been extremely positive. Um, they're working really hard with the, with the staff group. I think the staff group are now in a place whereby they can see, A, that we need to make um, some really fundamental changes, but equally are much more open to that now. And I think that very much is down to the sort of the, the hands-on direct input that we've got from the Mental Health Directorate. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Diggy Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I should have said earlier um, that I've got an interest um, to declare in relation to the fostering service um, as I'm on the fostering panel by virtue of my membership of this committee. I should have said that earlier. Um, that's not what my question relates to. My question relates to the inspection of children and families and, and, and under progress against recommendation two, there's a reference to uh, a problem 
with the introduction of solicitors to the children's hearing system. Um, I wonder if you could maybe um, give us some information on what that problem was and has it now been resolved? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, it's been quite a challenging time for um, staff attending the children's hearing process, and that's because um, under legal aid, then the adults involved in the child's life, so I, that could be the biological parents or grandparents, are entitled to have legal aid uh, to seek challenge against the panel decisions. And the principle of that is the right to family life. However, from our point of view, sometimes the biological parents is not the correct place for the child to be. So the panel members who are then faced by a legal representation um, challenging the right to family life from the adult's perspective, not the child perspective, has, has proven to be extremely challenging. This is a, a national issue and a consequence of the change in the access to legal aid, which um, has been raised both locally and at a national level. Uh, some of the challenges that we've had is that as a local authority, and this is the same for every local authority, legal representation is not available to staff attending the hearing and representing the child, um, whereas legal representation is entitled to the, the, the biological parent or parent with, um, sorry, guardian with parental responsibility. So we've been uh, working very hard with our panel members so that they understand the principles of the children's hearing system and that the rights of the child and the child at the centre is at the forefront of that decision making. But it would be um, absolutely correct to say that that has been very challenging in particular where social workers themselves um, are attacked with regards to their decision making where it's absolutely correct and proper for the child but the panel may view it's not correct and proper for the adult. So it's getting that fine balance. So I would say that um, much of it has been resolved, but there still is a residue of some panel members who um, need to fully understand the impact for the child. And we're working closely with our colleagues in the children's hearing system to address some of those ongoing issues. Thank you. And just uh, for, the, for the note of the meeting, I take it we'll be able to um, record the declaration of interest by virtue of your membership of the panel, but not, that, not such that you need to leave the meeting. I suppose. Yeah, that's noted. Thank you. Um, Councillor uh, Murray. Uh, thanks. Mine was more sort of a, a general uh, inquiry because it seems all four of these uh, services have, over the, the period of the three inspections, seen a reduction in performance, which is sort of worrying because it's not just one organisation, it's, it's not just one service, it's actually across all four. And I wondered if we have any sort of handle on why that is. Is it a difficulty in recruiting staff? Is it problems with training? You know, wh why do we think there is a general diminution in performance across the piece? Thank you, Heather. Are you able to address that? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's hard to say. I think it's unusual for us to have, um, you know, this number of services whereby they've had a dip in their performance in the same period that they've been inspected. But when you actually look at some of the detail and the recommendations from each, there isn't a huge, you know, it's nothing that jumps out to say actually here's a specific problem that's going across all of the services. Um, you know, in some parts you could say, well, it might be something around some of our staff training, but again, it's different staff training, so it wouldn't necessarily be the same of what you would give sort of to adult services, you give to children and families. So it's been, you know, in some senses it would be easier if we could look at it and say, actually, there's the issue and we, we've got an issue, but we haven't been able to do that. Um, so what we've tried to do is look really closely at what the recommendations have been, what we think the issues have been in each of the services, and, and try and provide um, a quite a detailed progress report for you, so that actually we're really showing that, that actually we're trying to move things forward and get a hold of those particular issues. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wood and then Councillor Dempster. Thank you, Chair. It's just when you look at the number of recommendations that you've had to address, and obviously there's progress taking place there, but there must have been quite a major impact on the capacity of your, your various sectors within the services. How has it affected the services that we were providing through that period of adjustment? It's always very difficult for any service where they get a, an inspection report and it comes with a, a whole series of, of recommendations. You expect some, um, but when there's certainly a long list, that does put pressure on the whole service. 
both staff and managers, because then you're really focused on a let's understand what those issues are and let's look at what it is we need to do. Now, that then might mean that, that some things that you were looking at trying to do, you're thinking we need to set that aside because we need to focus now on these recommendations coming from the care inspectorate. So I certainly wouldn't underestimate the impact that has. The progress hopefully will show that actually the, the overall impact is more positive because once you actually get a hold of the issue and you start to make some of that sort of um, progress, then actually people begin to feel a bit better about what's going on. They, they feel they're more satisfied about what they're doing and feel they're achieving more than they were previously. So, But it's that, that little period where you've got between the inspector telling you what's up and getting your action plan in and starting to see, because it does take a few weeks to see, start to see some of the progress. That's probably the most difficult. Once you turn the corner and you can see the progress settling in, then I think certainly for staff, um, then I think that can actually feel much more reassuring and obviously then they're more satisfied that the outcomes for whether it's children and families or it's adult care are, are better. I was going to let Lillian in there because I think she has something to add. So, Just really to say that um, we absolutely take on board the, the um, external scrutiny and some of these areas that were raised we were already aware of and we were starting to do some of that work. So whilst Heather's absolutely right, there is a period of impact, the longer term prog process and progress that we've made um, allows staff to see that we take this seriously and, and we will look to address all of those issues as raised. So now that you've gone through this and we'll have a period of time when it's in practice, will we be waiting on the inspectorate to give us a report back or will we be doing an internal one ourselves prior to that? Okay. Um, we're not doing an, an internal inspection as it were. What we will do is we will monitor the progress. We'll also be talking to the care inspector so that whilst they, they can't and won't change their grades until they've done their next inspection, we'll get a sense of whether they think the progress is sufficient. You know, an example of that would be the respite unit at the Ryans. So although what you've got is the report on our progress date on that, I know that last week we had the care inspector back in we know that the feedback from them is exceptionally positive and therefore what we're heading for in our next inspection will be improved grade. But of course, we can't, we can't, I can't tell you that officially because we haven't got to that point. We haven't had that inspection, but that was very reassuring for us because that is that bit about making sure that actually we are taking things, A, in the right direction, but also the pace in terms of, of what it is we need to do and when we do it. Thanks, Heather. And um, Councillor Dempster. Hey, thanks, Chair. Apologies for being late today. I had an emergency run to the vet for my dog before I came down this morning. Hey, like leader, I'm, 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 I'm disappointed that every score that's reflected on the, on the chart here is lower, or, or, or at least no better than it was before. And I just wonder, is the care inspector, at, or, or do the care inspectors arrive, are they the same people all of the time, or are some more demanding than others? Because it could be something just as simple as that. Because I thought we'd got the better of this. And I thought we had a lot of work invested in the, 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 these units and, and services to make sure they're the same. And I know in the past we have put a lot of effort in. And I'm quite surprised that this particular set of figures has has come to light. And it might be something as simple as something more demanding than others when inspected place. I think there's a... I did, it was pointed out to me earlier that sometimes we're actually looking at different... Um, different assessments because of the four categories maybe only two of them are being assessed and sometimes that can be a bit of variation but Heather uh, will give you a much more uh, professional answer than that so well I was going to actually say that that they don't always um, assess the same quality indicators so sometimes it is difficult to make that sort of comparison between the two we can't always guarantee it will be the same inspector so yes sometimes we do get a different inspector in they will take a slightly different approach to things um you know that's a a difficult one to, to gear really. Um, also, we vary between most of our inspections would be unannounced. Some of the inspections are short notice, you know, and that, and that does make a difference in terms of, of um, impact and, and effect, certainly on in terms of staff particularly. So yes, if it's as simple as that, that would be lovely. Um, I'm not sure that it probably is, but I think it is certainly one of the factors that's really important to, to take note of. Okay, members, thank you. Um, with that, then we can go to the recommendations. Uh, I have no further questions. So, um, are we happy to note the outcome of the scrutiny activity? Um, 
And 2.2, consider the progress being made, and obviously with the answers we've been, and assurances we've been given, that's um, some encouragement. Are we happy with that, 2.2? And then 2.3, consider the progress for those services previously reported with grades at three and below. Are we happy to feel that we've considered that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, we can go on to item number eight, which is non-residential community care charging policy 2019-20. to 20. Um, We've got uh, Angela and Sean here to take any questions um, from members. I don't know if there's anything you wish to add um, before taking questions from the floor. Thank you, Chair. Just to explain that this is the annual report which introduces the um, income uh, thresholds for 2019-20 in line with COSLA guidance. And the major change for the, this current year now is the introduction, introduction of free personal care for under 65s. We're happy to take any questions. Yeah. Okay, well, first up, I think we've got Councillor McGregor and then Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Chair. Just a very brief question. It's in relation to 3.1. Um, councils you can use legal powers to charge for non-residential social care services within an overall context of financial and demographic pressures, which is perfectly reasonable. And it was, I just wonder, with the increases that are being proposed, where would that have a sitting in relation to comparator authorities? I, I understand about the national guidance, but where will it sit in comparison to our comparator authorities? Okay, which one is, wants that the most, Sean? Okay. okay. Um, we do benchmark across our other authorities when we compare the, the unit costs that we apply, we compare the thresholds. Um, all local authorities um, have to deliver efficiencies and savings to make up the, the, the shortfall. We're not proposing to, to make any changes to the policy to fill that shortfall. Some local authorities are, but they, they do it through different ways, maybe through um, changing the, the unit costs. But it's very difficult if, if you're trying to apply national policy to increase the income because you know people have an assessed ability to pay, and that is really all that you can you can apply charges to. So we are quite comparable with the rest of the, the other the, the odd local authorities. By comparable, do you mean we're charging slightly more, slightly less, or virtually exactly the same? It's uh, it varies across the different sort of basket of charges. For the likes of telecare, I think we're five pence above the national average. We're three sixty. I think the average is three fifty five. But you'll have some authorities will charge nine pound say, per week. And um, when it comes to, to the unit costs, I think our fifteen pound ninety one for care at home is uh, slightly below the national the national average. It, it's kind of it's, ve it's very variable. Chair, I just wonder on that basis if it wouldn't be useful if we could sort of see some of the comparisons. Um, and I think it just contextualises it. We, we know that all local authorities have budget pressures, but it's just to see where we sit in context to other local authorities. No, I think that's a fair point. I'm sure all members would welcome knowing where we sit, um, as Councillor McGregor's pointed out, in relation to everybody else. We have now Councillor Maitland. Well, my question was really on a, along a very similar line, um, that um, I, I understand that we're following COSLA guidance, but it's not exactly clear to me because there does seem to be discretion, and we've said very clearly the unit costs have been held. Um, and I, I, I wasn't totally clear what the justification was for that, because it's not absolutely clear in here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I know there's a cap, Yes. Obviously, at the total, for the total amount that you can you can charge somebody, but I, I do do wonder whether, um, given that that these costs are probably going to be rising, um, whether we actually should be justifying and looking clearly about whether or not we can expect to to uh, increase our costs, increase our our, our income. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Maitland. I think it would be um, perfectly possible for us to provide some benchmarking information and to provide um, a series of options if members would like to, to see those and consider. But bearing in mind that this is part of the delegated budget and would need to be in consultation with IJB. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Murray. So, sorry, Chair. 
Sean needed to come in on. Beg your pardon, beg your pardon. On you go, Sean. So just to sort of add to that a wee bit of sort of explanation behind it, there's not many people who will pay the, their full ability to pay. So if you consider, say, somebody had a, a, a £10, a, let's get an easier example, a £50 ability to pay, and they had four hours of care, if you charge £15 an hour for four hours of care at £60, they would pay £50 of that. So you've, even if you increased the hourly charge to, to £50 an hour, you're still only going to take so much. So there's, there's, you, you've got to be careful when, where you pitch that um, hourly rate. The £15.91 is probably four or four, five years old now when, when care costs that. The, the care costs have increased quite significantly and we haven't applied that because we can only apply it to their ability to pay. So, so increasing the prices wouldn't actually generate you more income. Uh, and also reducing the prices, whilst it might reduce the, the, the income on the short-term basis, you're likely then to have somebody to have capital building up and then they would start to, to move closer to um, sort of having a higher ability to pay. It's, there's a lot of factors which push and shove against it that, that you don't want to probably put too much effort into coming up with a unit cost because there's only so much you can, you, you can apply to someone's financial assessment. But we're happy to, to, to maybe do some work on that to explain it a bit better. Could I, do you mind? Um, I wonder if there's, there's anything else. Um, if we have a particular, if we have a low unit cost, does that then say to the powers that be or COSLA or whoever it is, ah, that means, do you see what I mean? Because there are, there are unintended consequences by um, artificially maybe deflating our unit costs. So I'd, I'd like to know if there's anything there because that would be a mistake. I, I agree with you. There's, there's maybe a way of pre presenting this, um, and we'll, we'll do a bit of work to, to try and um, explain that or try and find out a bit more about it. So I think just before I let Councillor Murray in, um, and apologies for not letting you come in, Sean, uh, but just in terms of what, some, some information coming back from members would be that benchmarking and maybe some more detail or how we can better present the information about how costs are arrived at. Um, so that members get a bit, you know, a better understanding of the rationale behind it, for example, and any impacts that may have. Um, so we've got a more comprehensive. View. Just a wee thing on three point two as well. It does say there um, about the reduction in income by five hundred k because of the the um, uh, free personal care, but that's offset, I think, to some degree by the funding. And of course, we won't know the full impact of that until that's sort of been able to run its course for a while. But there, it's not a sort of gap as such because there is a kind of um, funding there to offset that close. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Uh, yeah, yes, you are correct. The, the Scottish Government, uh, and it's in paper three, the paper five, I think it was, the, the financial paper, we got 780k from the Scottish Government to go towards free personal care for under 65. The 500k is not an additional pressure. We have been funded. Um, the 500k is our estimate that we will lose income because there's so many people who now fall into getting not being charged for their care. So that 500, we have received the funding from the Scottish Government. The other 280k, we'll have to wait and see. We expect more people will come to the service now for, for personal care and maybe be assessed as uh, is entitled to that care. So that would that would be the gap. But we have done a, a bit of work across the, across the people who we charge at the moment, and it's estimated about 500k. We'd, we'll see a reduction in income, but we have been funded for it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Murray. Yes, it's, uh, my question really was about um, the difference between C4, this is actually referring to the policy itself, with C4, which is the uh, full economic cost of care per hour at £25.23, and the home care services per hour at £15.91. Because I know in the lady that's... Uh, Example 5 on page 95, that in terms of the cost of care provided, the £25.23 is being applied to her case, whereas the £15.91 is being applied to, for example, the, to the lady in example 4. Um, I was also a bit concerned about this lady because she seemed to be being charged more than uh, the total cost of her services, but I understand that's a, a misprint and it should say £421.85. But I, I just want, for example, in the case of this person, if she chose to get self-directed support and buy in her care, 
from a care provider, she probably wouldn't have to pay £25, £23 per hour for that care, at least not from my personal experience of my mother's care. Yes, you are correct. It is a, is a mistake, and I'll, I'll correct that. It's the, the lower charge, the 421.85, that this lady would be charged. It's been in our policy for, for a number of years now, as far as I can remember, that anyone who is, sits above the, um, the the capital amounts that they would be financially assessed or choose not to be financially assessed, then we apply what we call the full, the full cost of recovery, which includes... Um, not just the amount that we have to pay for to the to the care the carer or the care agency, but also the the a share of the overheads, etc. So it is a you could say we we are charging people who have who have you know sums of wealth above the the capital limits. We're charging them more, but it's always been in the policy. Um, you're right. You could employ a personal assistant and wouldn't pay anywhere near that level of care. Also, the flip side is you could maybe bring in an in-house service, which possibly could be above £25 per hour. It's it's an average, and as I said to Councillor Maitland, these are they've been held at that price for quite some number of years now, so so they are probably a bit out of out of date. But in that case, where a case like that, when somebody has ex, is, is above the cap, capital threshold or, or whatever, and they they could have a property, for example, which was worth more. Than, well, it's very likely to be worth more than the, the total threshold. Are they advised that they, they, they could maybe get a cheaper service if they chose to go down the self-directed support unit, uh, route rather than uh, getting it through social work? Certainly the, the starting principle during the assessment process is to discuss the opportunity to apply for SDS. That is always the starting point from social workers. Any further questions from members on the charging policy? Okay, um, so we've got the recommendations there to note, um, and I think um, given that we've given it a, a few questions, we're happy to do that. But we've got an additional, shall we say, a recommendation to bring back, to agree to bring back a report um, that benchmarks our uh, charging policy against. Sorry, Gail. Sorry, um, not to intervene, and it'll be obviously up to other members to decide. I, I don't require a further report. Just if that information was, was emailed to us, I, I don't want to utilise any more resource than is necessary. I don't know as a member, but I know I, I think it. I think we need the information. I'm just sort of um, sort of trying to determine what the best way to bring it back is. Whether it would be um, as in the form of a report, and then that way it's sort of public information, or. Um, if we should then just get the details circulated to members, so I mean, I think Councillor Maitland's saying that if there's a report coming anyway, it can be part of that. But I wouldn't want it to be specifically for that reason. Okay, so uh, Lillian, what what can we do? What I would propose, members, is that we formulate a benchmarking report and circulate it. And if required at the next committee, we could include it as part of another report. Perfect. So on that basis then, are we happy to go with the recommendations with um, what Lillian just said? Agreed? Thank you. Right, so um, that takes us on to report number nine, which is the Social Work Scotland Annual Conference and Exhibition, 12th to 13th of June. Uh, effectively, we've just been asked to note this. So 2.1 is to note the details of the annual conference as detailed, and also to agree to receive a report at a future meeting from an attending officer on the detail provided at the conference. Are we, are we happy to do that? Thank you. And then the last item uh, for today is item number 10, which is a note of the, the minute of meeting of the Public Protection Committee um, on 10th of January. Are we happy to note that? Okay. Thank you. Um, I have no further business. With that, you're free to go. Thanks for your input today.